to welcome to Palazzo Franchetti, to our institute. And uh, uh, being a biologist interested in molecular genetics, uh, it's really a honor to speak at the beginning of this very important meeting. Um, if you, uh, if you like, I, I can just uh, for a very short uh, history to recall that uh, uh, Giovanni Canestrini, who at the end of the uh, 19th century translated into Italian the complete works of Charles Darwin, was a distinguished zoologist and a member of our institute. So the same, the Italian writer Antonio Fogazzaro, who a few years later attempted to reconcile the Darwinian evolution with Catholic doctrine, was president of our institute, but unfortunately he couldn't escape the fierce condemnation of the church at, this, at that time. But in order to make a very long story very short, I would like to jump uh, to uh, 2009, the Davinia year, when my colleague and friend George Bernardi brought here the International Meeting Basic Issues in Evolution, a Darwin 200 Symposium, which was um, jointly organized by U UBS, UNESCO, Stazione Zoologica di Napoli, and our institute. The present meeting is uh, on the ideal line of progress uh, of the previous meeting. It is particularly interesting and timely because uh, it focuses uh, on interpretation of evolutionary phenomena at the genomic level. And actually, the last decade witnessed a tremendous progress in genomics and bioinformatics, and both these disciplines concurred in giving a very solid ground to comparative genomics and in making possible to explore totally new areas like epigenomics. So uh, I'm very grateful to organizing, the organizer for having selected this venue for a such important meeting. And uh, I simply would like to wish you a fruitful work in these three days and a pleasant stay in Venice and in Palazzo Franchetti. Mm -hmm. So I leave the, to Giorgio Bernardi to introduce uh, the uh, venue. Just a few words to say how this meeting started. Uh, I simply met Maria Leptin uh, last year. There was the commemoration of the opera at the Pasteur Institute in honor, in honor of Francois Jacob. And I said, well, I'm surprised that in spite of all the activities of EMBO, and I know them because uh, with Werner we are members of EMBO since 1964, so from the very beginning. To my knowledge, only once EMBO was involved in a meeting on evolution, but that was 20 years ago. So I said, well, maybe it is time to have another one, particularly in view of all the progress in, the, in many areas of evolution and in particular in uh, genomics. And uh, fortunately, she was extremely positive, so I submitted a proposal. And uh, with the names uh, who, of my colleagues who are here and who had accepted to uh, take part in the meeting, uh, well, the problem of deciding in a positive way was not a problem. So it was immediately accepted. So I'm very happy that EMBO, for the second time in its history, is uh, sponsoring a meeting on evolution. I am, of course, extremely grateful to Instituto Veneto. I'm a member of the Instituto Veneto to host uh, this meeting. Uh, this is a special place, in my opinion. Well, it is probably, I'm influenced by the 12 years I spent in Venice when I was a, a young fellow. Uh, I mean, uh, high school and uh, university in Padova. So uh, I think we are going to have now three days, which are rather intense, uh, even perhaps too much. But uh, I don't think we are wasting our time by listening at the presentations. So I would like to uh, thank very much all the people who have accepted to be here as speakers and uh, the support of my co-organizers, Werner Arber, Dan Hartl, Takashi Gojobori, who unfortunately at the last moment could not come. And uh, so we, we are all here and uh, we are going to do now the following very brief presentation by Emil Zuckerkandl, which was 
he was supposed to, to, be, to be with us. It is the 50th anniversary of the famous paper with Linus Pauling on uh, uh, molecular evolution. And unfortunately, he could not come. So uh, my son, Giacomo, who is uh, at the University of California in Santa Cruz, went to see him, and uh, he recorded a brief, uh, so it is, it is really a very simple and brief interview, and uh, we are going to listen at uh, what Emil is going to say. Uh, it is a matter of remembering that everything started with that paper 50 years ago. So, uh, and then, of course, we go on with another commemoration by uh, Dan Hartle about uh, Jim Crow. So, welcome once more to uh, Venice and to Palazzo Franchetti, uh, Istituto Veneto in particular, and we are going to now to listen and see uh, Emil Zuckerkandl mention some personal reminiscence about the 1962 paper. Thank you. Dear friends, I am so sorry not to be with you and to say these few words to you from a la big distance only when I would really enjoy so much being much closer to, uh, to you. I thank you immensely for uh, the interest you have in hearing me talk at all. I don't quite understand why you do, but uh, uh, it is great for me that uh, this actually is occurring, even so, in my mind it of course cannot replace my being with you and seeing you and talking with you. So all best wishes to you for a wonderful meeting that I would have so much wished to be able to attend myself. So when you, uh, when you uh, moved to Caltech and work with Linus Pauling, was, uh, was, was there already in your mind the idea of working on what was to become molecular evolution? Or uh, what was the, the overall atmosphere in the lab of Linus Pauling at the time? Uh, there was, uh, so far as I remember, nothing ongoing at, at the time in the field of molecular evolution that as such uh, had not, ha or had, was just forming, so, uh, so, uh, so to speak. I very naturally uh, drifted in, in, into that. Uh, Jane, do you remember something that I might uh, Say this is uh, uh, what I mean is, uh, so in 1962 there is this uh, this uh, incredible paper that uh, the two of you wrote and um, that compares protein evolution with time, and this is just completely different than anything else that had been done before. How did the, the entire idea come about? Was it a discussion between the two of you? Uh, how, do you remember how the, uh, the, the, the idea of molecular, uh, evol or, or molecular clock came about? Uh, I, I believe I can say that uh, uh, I evolved uh, uh, ideas quite independently. Uh, that. Uh, uh, the, the usual pattern of things was that uh, uh, I wrote the paper and, uh, and pretty often I think it was a, a suggestion of, of uh, Linus Pauling that uh, we, we might write a paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, then I wrote it all together and submitted it to him and in general uh, the changes that he introduced were uh, moderate, uh, and the paper essentially came out as uh, I had conceived it. Uh, about just scientific discovery in general, uh, it, the, the, the idea of the molecular clock that over 50 years has 
changed, has been refined, but the very fundamentals of it are, are still here and very much so and are being used more and more, if anything. But the, the original discovery, did it come to you gradually or was there a sort of eureka moment where all of a sudden you noticed a pattern of divergence in, uh, in those globins or, or did it come to you gradually? Was there, can you remember of a moment where something special happened? Uh, no. Uh, it, it, it seemed natural to, uh, to wonder whether uh, the, the su succession of uh, changes that uh, were obviously taking place during evolution and that not exclusively by any means but to a large extent uh, were uh, then uh, known as attributable uh, primarily to exchanges of individual uh, bases in uh, genes or um, amino acids in, in, in corresponding uh, proteins that uh, such uh, changes uh, came out uh, with a, a frequency uh, that uh, uh, could be represented by means uh, that were not as such uh, meaningless, uh, namely that different means uh, of substitution rates of the components of the informational macromolecules uh, of biological objects uh, would in fact be uh, characteristics that uh, should be analyzed and, uh, and evaluated properly. Now when uh, another aspect of the, the discovery uh, process that I find interesting is that your discovery and your paper became far-reaching and to this day there are entire softwares that are designed around the idea and there are, I mean, hundreds if not thousands, probably thousands of scientific papers that are based on it. When you first uh, wrote this paper in 1962, did you expect it to have such far-reaching uh, consequences? I don't think I was thinking in those terms. It uh, just uh, seemed to me a probable uh, aspect of the, the reality of uh, the evolution of substances that were characterized by a varying combination of uh, uh, chemical units, uh, in the case of the proteins, uh, the amino acids, uh, and uh, of uh, various alignments of, of these units. Uh, with the uh, effects of the differences in, in, in these uh, combinations and, and, and alignments uh, accounting for the different functional effects of uh, the macromolecules that resulted. Mm -hmm. a symbol of a long and uh, productive life. And uh, Giorgio asked me to say a few words about the passing of James F. Crow, who had a long and productive life. He was 95 years old when he died recently in January. He was two weeks from turning 96. He was writing papers until a week before he died, and he passed very easily and uh, quietly in his sleep. Uh, I don't think he would want us to mourn him. I think he would want us to celebrate him. And that is because he is one of the most cheerful people I've ever known. He uh, is well known for 
having had a great number of students, uh, some of whose names are here and who you may recognize, during the years that Crow was a professor at the University of Wisconsin, the Department of Genetics had 12 students, who had 10 students who became members of the National Academy of Sciences. Six of those were Crow, students of Crow's. Um, he was also a great friend and supporter of his Japanese colleagues, which is why I thought this tie would be appropriate. Um, he was also one of the most friendly people you would ever uh, you could ever encounter. He could argue a point without ever giving offense or taking offense. Every argument was above that of personal animosity. Uh, here are some of the most prickly personalities in population genetics in the 20th century. Uh, many of them did not get along with each other very well, but Crow got along with them all. Um, Haldane is not gesturing in the way that you might think. He's holding a cigarette. Uh, Perhaps uh, his most famous student uh, was Moto Kimura. Here's a picture from 1972. Crow visited Japan very often. His wife was a, Frank, was a Japanophile as well and spoke fluent Japanese. Um, and here is one final picture commemorating this great, long, and productive life of a meeting from, at the National Institute of Genetics uh, in 1984. Uh, many of the people in this audience, at least four or five, will recognize themselves in this picture in a much earlier incarnation than they now look. Um, and uh, so uh, with that, and in the shadow of San Marco, San Giorgio, San Stefano, and all of the 141 churches in Venice and the Lagoon Islands, uh, let us say, requiescat in pace, professore. Now we shall turn to the first session, uh, which is entitled, Some Basic Issues in Evolution. We have uh, three speakers and then a coffee break, and then three more speakers. And do you mind if we start just a few minutes early, Giorgio? Uh, oh, there's one th more thing I wanted to say that I forgot. It'll be very short, Werner, I promise. And that is, I, on, on behalf of everybody here, I want to thank Giorgio Bernardi for having invested a great deal of time and effort in organizing this wonderful meeting and obtaining support for it and arranging the venue and the hotels and all the other things that go along with it. It's a tremendous amount of work, so I thank you. Very much. And now we will begin with the first speaker, who is uh, Werner Arber, who is going to talk about molecular mechanisms of genetic variation as revealed by microbial genetics. Well, good morning. Microbial genetics has its roots in the 1940s. And since that time, a tremendous amount of knowledge has been acquired with uh, bacteria and their viruses, phages. Uh, that's the field on which I was working and uh, I like to make a short uh, uh, kind of memorizing what has been found in the course of this, uh, these decades. I do not do any ex experimental work any longer since some time and don't expect to have new data. I think probably at the previous meeting similar uh, conclusions I had been given before. So let's start with neo-Darwinian evolution, the three pillars. One is, uh, of course, genetic variation. Without variation, there wouldn't be any evolution if ever all the genetic information would be 
constant forever. Therefore, uh, genetic variation is the driving, driving force of evolution. The direction which evolution takes is a uh, result from natural selection, of course, together with all the available parental and uh, variant forms of living beings. And natural selection, in fact, is the result by which organisms succeed to deal with their constraints their in, of their environment. And the environment is composed on physical chemical composition on the one hand and on the composition of the ecosystems in which many different uh, living beings live together. Micro microbes, plants, animals, and even human beings. Um, of course, uh, Charles Darwin doing some work on the Galapagos Islands gave a good example of isolation which to some degree can modulate the process of evolution. We wanted now on the molecular evolution community to know how are genetic variants being built, formed spontaneously without the impact of the researchers. There are nowadays two possibilities. One is to make DNA sequencing of more or less related organisms, compare the sequences and try to make conclusions how these small differences could come about. Another approach is to go stepwise, individually. And this is how uh, the easiest access is by doing microbial genetics. So I will take the examples rather from microbial genetics. Much of that work has been done with E. coli bacteria, uh, which has been shown to have a genome composed of just one circular DNA molecule of almost five million base pairs. And that uh, DNA is relatively densely packed with genes which have their reading frames. If there is a mutation within the reading frame, uh, the property of the product may be changed or uh, annulated completely. If there is uh, mutations in expression control signals, you may uh, have changes in the availability of the gene product. E. coli bacteria have the nice property if you provide them with a good nutrient to grow from one cell division to the next in about half an hour, so that after an hour you already have four cells. What I put here on that projection is a bit wrong because the first mutation which would show up if you do that starting from one cell in the average is between two and three hundred cells once you have uh, reached that stage after a few hours. You have the first mutation. Some of the mutations as shown here are little, have no progeny, others uh, are growing and finally you have a population of parental forms and variants uh, which of course are steadily submitted to natural selection. Um, I think for us today it's quite good to remind us that in the classical genetics a mutation was always defined by a changed phenotype. We molecular geneticists think <laughs> a mutation is changed nucleotide sequence. And uh, it's good to remember that because in the, 
interdisciplinary di dialogue, it's good to know how do you define mutation. I define it, as I said, as an alteration in the sequence of nucleotides, and it is a kind of relatively good agreement in the uh, community of biologists that favorable, useful mutations are rather rare. And so selective advantage is not the rule when you change the uh, environment. Rather, more often, you have unfavorable mutations. Uh, can be lethal, as I mentioned before, or to some degree inhibiting the life processes, so that at long term, uh, they will disappear again from propagating populations. Often, a mutation is neutral. There are, we know, many reasons for that, uh, that it doesn't influence uh, the uh, function of the living being. So the conclusion which I wrote, wrote, put here in green, no good evidence for directedness of spontaneous mutations. I have to be careful. I will show you in a moment that there is a multitude of different specific molecular mechanisms causing mutagenesis. So that doesn't say that particular ways to obtain mutations may be to some degree directed. There are experiments going this direction, but there is not really a, a general rule that when you come into a new environment, you know which gene to change in which way to uh, deal with the environment in a better way. Uh, this is a summary of knowledge which was accumulated and it shows again on the left side the sources of <coughs> mutation, genetic variation. On the uh, right side, uh, selection, natural selection and isolation on top. And you see in the mechanisms that there are a number of different groups. For example, replication infidelities. These are, can be, I will give you one example for that. Then uh, mutagens can be chemical mutagens uh, and often chemical mutagens as well as replication infidelities are very local. Nucleotide substitution, deletion of one or very few adjacent nucleotides or insertion of additional nucleotides just at one place or uh, mingling the sequence up to some degree. Then coming again to the mutagens, uh, physical mutagens, radiations may give breaks in the DNA and that causes SOS signal for repair uh, with uh, sister chromosomes, between sister chromosomes to reconstitute an active chromosome. Uh, and interesting, these are uh, general recombination enzymes, which in general are not fully present. You will see in a moment why that would not be very good. Um, there is horizontal gene transfer. That's an important way which for a long time has been studied for medical reasons in microorganisms and finally uh, was recognized to be also present in higher organisms. Uh, just look on the top line. This is uh, totomeric forms. It, the example here on the top line is uh, timing in its, its standard form, of course, as we all know, uh, compare with time, uh, uh, sorry, adenine compare with in its normal form with thymine, while in its uh, amino form, uh, where the uh, hydrogen atom is uh, associated with another, at another place, it can not any longer pair with thymine, but it does so with cytosine. Watson Crick already 
showed that in 53 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. So this is a fact. And in fact, that would happen uh, too often to uh, make a uh, living being active if there wouldn't be repair systems. And wonderfully, the repair system enzymatic knows which is the parental strand, which is the newly informed strand, and most of the time the repair is perfect. Once, uh, because the uh, totomeric form is very short living, it can't be just, but if it's there at the time when the uh, replication fork moves by, then you have a mispairing and that has to be repaired. Um, there is a other group of recombination enzymes, I mentioned already the general recombination, and in E. coli there are a lot of uh, transposable elements, IS elements of various types, and these are having a length of about 1,000 nucleotides and provide homology. If there would be a general recombination fully available all the time, these would recombine with each other and uh, rearrange the genome. And uh, therefore, uh, general recombination enzymes shouldn't be present all the time, but when you need them after irradiation, as I mentioned, uh, it's induced for a short time and then uh, they fade away again. There is site-specific recombinations, and I would like to give you examples uh, for transposition and for site-specific recombination. Here you see again the E. coli chromosome, and this is the genome, uh, the, the, the picture of a P1, bacteriophage P1 lysogen. The prophage P1 is not integrated generally into the E. coli chromosome, but uh, is replicated as a uh, single molecular plasmid. Uh, once in a while, an uh, IS element can jump over, and if it hits within uh, an important gene for the function of the phage, of course the phage cannot reproduce any longer. So that's easy to see because these lysogens can be induced to produce phage. Uh, and uh, that can be done by, for example, shining ultraviolet light on the cell, and uh, if there is no phage coming out, that's a sign that there is a little mutation. As far as I know, I'm still proud on that experiment, there are very few experiments showing how little mutations come about. And interestingly, we were surprised to see that 95% of all independently induced P1 mutants of this kind were due to jumping IS elements. Only 5% uh, local mutations. Therefore, the locals are less important to create in the, this bacteriophage uh, lethal mutations. IS uh, transposition is much more important. Having uh, done that work with a number of independently isolated P1, we could map where the insertion occurred, and we had, could see that uh, on top, in red, that IS2 was the most important uh, transposition. Uh, other elements were less often, and you see the distribution is by far not random. Uh, you believe that there is an area on which most of them, this may be a hot area, and then it was a question, are these IS2 all going on the same spot or not? Interesting, all of those analyzed, as you see, uh, are at different specific locations, but they are in this area. And they are in two different orientations also. In contrast, the three uh, IS30 found in this study were all precisely between the two same base pairs, and two in one direction and one in the other direction. You see these transposing elements, each one has its own strategy to do so. 
although we know that at much lower frequency, IS-30 once in a while goes elsewhere also than in that particular sequence. Um, the other elements uh, are three other elements, and you see uh, their distribution. Um, this is a short theoretical presentation of site-specific DNA inversion. That has also been studied in tail fiber genes of bacteriophage P1, but also in surface properties of salmonella and other bacteria. That's a situation in which an enzyme, an inversion en enzyme, uh, identifies 26 base pair long consensus sequences, which you show there drawn, the, large, the capital letters are the consensus, and N means can be any uh, other nucleotide. Uh, at that moment, relatively often, the inversion, if the such two sequences are carried in the same DNA molecules in inverted orientation, the whole thing is f making a flip-flop back and forth. And interestingly, in P1, the uh, flip-flop occurs within the reading frame of a tail fiber, which is responsible for host range of the P1. So in that P1 population, we always have two kind of host ranges, uh, one particular series of hosts and another particular series of hosts. So we had then seen that uh, this system with much lower frequencies, much lower means 10 to the minus 5 from, from the frequency of flip-flop, you get uh, what I call secondary crossover sites. And that has been studied. Shigeru Ida, when he was in my lab, he had constructed a plasmid to test that with an open reading frame for canamycin resistance, but having no promoter. And nearby, there was a, one consensus chicks marked here, uh, and, but no other in the whole plasmid, relatively small plasmid. So uh, we put that plasmid into E. coli, then selected rare calamycin resistant mutants and analyzed the plasmid again. And each time uh, a promoter was in front of that uh, calamycin resistant gene. And interestingly, you see uh, the positions, sequences of these secondary sites. There is no general rule. One could say that must be there or not there. Uh, there is a big variety, and you see there is some statistical reproducibility, although many have been found in that experiment only once. One was found five times and two other three times, so the, uh, th two times. So there is some statistical reproducibility. I come now to the third, uh, what I call strategy, is horizontal transfer or G, uh, gene, uh, gene acquisition. This is based on the knowledge of bacterial genetics. We know transformation where free DNA molecules can penetrate into a cell, conjugation by cell-cell contact mediated by a, plas uh, a plasmid as a gene vector, and virus mediated transduction mediated where, where a, a virus, a, a bacteriophage mediates uh, gene transduction. There are various ways to do that, but there's no time to go into detail. Factors limiting gene acquisition, surfaces must be appropriate to do that, either uptake of DNA, uh, having been able for making uh, conjugation or phage absorption. Then when the DNA comes in, they encounter restriction modification systems in which foreign DNA, which has been replicated in another kind of cell before, uh, is identified as foreign and cut into fragments. And finally, if uh, a segment becomes incorporated, it must be uh, the, the harmony of the functional 
cell must not be destroyed functional compatibilities. Uh, usually, the strategy of horizontal transfer is the better, the smaller uh, steps uh, it occurs. One gene or a, even sometimes a segment of a gene. Uh, those of you who work with restriction enzymes may believe that the restriction enzymes always cut in the recognition sequence. Uh, that's not correct. So nature, nature has a lot of inventiveness. Of course, I would say probably uh, roughly half of restriction modification systems do like uh, here shown ECOR1 cut right in the recognition sequence if there is no uh, metal groups on these adenines they are marked with a star. Uh, that is the modification part uh, which protects the host's own DNA against its own restriction enzyme. Uh, the type 1 with which we had worked in the beginning uh, are a bit more complex. They, the enzymes also recognize a non-modified uh, recognition sequence as foreign DNA and then start to translocate the DNA from both sides uh, keeping track still one foot on the recognition side and keeping pro providing along the thing. If longer DNA molecules may have more than one recognition site, sooner or later this uh, complexes run into each other and then the DNA is cut. An interesting thing, evolutionary, very interesting because the chance to cut the DNA uh, at an important part of, of an acquired uh, foreign gene is in type 2 much larger than in, in type 1. Uh, so uh, many enzymes are of that. There are more than these two types which I show you here though. Now, I will come to some conclusions. Uh, Charles Darwin said that uh, living beings, that today's genetic diversity, have common origins. He didn't really mention it's one or several origins, and you, I do not know. We cannot study so far the origin of life, I must just be honest. But we can study what, how evolution proceeds nowadays under, under our eyes. And we do know that uh, there are once in a while horizontal connectors between branches of that t tree in which a short segment of genetic information can flow and provide information. And in that, with that knowledge we can add, add to Charles Darwin's saying that common origin, we all have common futures. Maybe in uh, future times you will have a chance to acquire a gene which was developed elsewhere. Um, this is a summary of what I said. It just go very rapidly through that. Local sequence change, uh, that can give stepwise improvements of something which already is functioning there. Uh, DNA rearrangements, as we had seen, can give gene fusions, can give fusions of a control element, of an alternative control element with an open reading frame, and so on and so forth. And the third strategy, DNA acquisition, is a sharing in the success made by others. That's quite efficient. In one step, uh, if you are a, a bacterium which is uh, sensitive to, uh, to antibiotics in one step by horizontal transfer of the appropriate uh, 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 resistant genes, you can become uh, resistant to the antibiotic. Um, the elements of the, what I call still the theory of molecular evolution is on the one hand we have gene products and I, in bacteria, I think it's justified. Bacteria can live without restriction systems. 
they can live without uh, generic combination and so on and so forth. Uh, there is haploidy and uh, therefore if these genes are there, well, occasionally expressed, uh, recombination enzymes can be variation generators and the repair systems, the restriction systems and so on are modulators of the rates of genetic variation. And I believe that uh, in the long past, uh, all the living beings have acquired these capacities of all the three strategies to make them uh, really uh, able to undergo appropriate evolution, be among us still today. Uh, and there is, of course, as I showed you with the totomeric example on the mutagens, there are other ways then gene products, non-genetic elements contribute to the whole thing too, that they collaborate with each other. Um, therefore, we can conclude that natural reality takes actively care of biological evolution. And you may know that I have been char in charge in some time uh, being the president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and uh, I'm very pleased to see that in this environment one sees actually evolution, not only biological evolution, but also cosmic evolution as a permanent creation. Uh, there are in that two antagonistic principles, uh, those promoting genetic variation at low rates um, and the other uh, limiting genetic variation that means providing uh, sorry uh, <laughs> you see it here uh, you have both protecting the, the cell uh, from undergoing too often mutation but allowing some mutation rates in order to be able to adapt to novel living conditions. Um, and a final conclusion is that the genome contains two types of genetic information which gives a du duality in the genome. Uh, many genes are beneficial for the individual these are the housekeeping genes, accessory genes for use under particular living conditions. And in higher organisms, of course, not for bacteria, developmental genes, while uh, the evolutionary genes, which in, we can all talk about that probably in the course of the next days, in the somatic cell may also sometimes be needed. Uh, so there it's a bit more complex, but in bacteria the situation is relatively clear. It uh, helps for the uh, expansion of life, for creating biodiversity, and hopefully for future time, re-furnishing uh, biodiversity. We suffer from losing biodiversity. It's always come up, not the same biodiversity which we are going to lose, of course. Nature is, is very wide. Thank you for your attention. I think we may have time for one question. Eric. I'm just curious, the E. coli in culture conditions must be either fiercely or destroyed. What is the rate of per, per generation genome? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, can, I, can I repeat the question? The question is, and maybe some of you didn't hear it, that in the when the repair system in E. coli is knocked out, what is the frequency of indels and SNPs? Well, uh, those who studied that first called them mutator genes because you have a higher rate of mutagenesis. But in fact, there would be just the contrary. The genes are mutated and did uh, miss the capacity uh, to repair uh, uh, the f uh, kind of uh, creating mutations. So 
the, 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 the name mutation gene is a wrong name, unfortunately, but it is in the literature. What? what is the quantitative difference in the rate of reversal? Oh, do you? I don't know. No, I cannot remember precisely, but uh, considerable, yeah. Because actually there are, for example, these substitutions would be rather more frequent than they are, yeah. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tomoko Ota, who will be talking about drift and selection in the light of epigenomics. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to visit this beautiful place again. I would like to uh, give at first very briefly, the development of the neutral and the nearly neutral, and many nearly neutral theories. In uh, about 50 years ago, a little more than 50 years ago, Kimura in Mishima was thinking to connect population genetics theory with molecular data available at that time. And 65, Zuko Kandru polling molecular clock paper appeared. And 68, Kimura's neutral theory published. Next year, King and Duke's non-Darwinian evolution appeared. And in 70, Ono's book on gene duplication appeared. It was really an exciting time for evolutionary biologists. And, uh, um, I, I have just started at that time, and I wonder almost from the beginning, beginning of the neutral theory, uh, three puzzling questions in my mind. One, what are borderline mutations between the selected and the neutral? Natural selection cannot be so simple as to be all or nothing. There must be something there. Molecular clock at that time, it was per year constancy, not per generation, whereas mutation rate is dependent upon generation time. What's, what's in there? A narrow range of heterozygosity. At that time, population genetics people were measuring uh, various species polymorphisms by electrophoresis. And, uh, they found not much difference between uh, uh, small populations and large populations, like a uh, mouse or a human. Uh, under the neutral prediction, heterozygosity should go up when population size goes up. So this is some problem. And in fact, uh, many selectionists uh, thought this is unconvincing evidence against the neutral theory. And I recognized by bringing very slightly deleterious mutations into the model, these three questions may be answered. The most basic quantity is fixation probability of a neutral mutant that is directly related to evolutionary rate. For uh, this is NES is the intensity of selection measured by, measured by the product of effective population size NE and the selection coefficient S. Uh, for a completely neutral case, fixation probability is equal to the initial frequency P, and for a slightly advantageous ones, it goes up, and slightly deleterious case uh, comes down. For a negative, negative region, there is a negative correlation between population size and fixation probability, that is evolutionary rate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, large organisms tend to have long generation time and small 
population size and vice versa. So there is a negative correlation between generation time and uh, uh, generation time and population size. This negative correlation would cancel with this fixation probability correlation to provide rough molecular clock. That was the original idea. Uh, the nearly neutron theory put very weakly selected mutation class between the selected and the neutral ones. Uh, this is the uh, folded diagram of the above one. So uh, this nearly neutral class includes both slightly deleterious and slightly advantageous mutations. So they include both. I repeat, prediction of the neutral theory. Evolutionary rate is equal the neutral mutation rate. This is very simple and elegant theory. And it, this is useful for predicting natural selection, very much used. And the nearly neutral theory is more complicated. Uh, there is a negative correlation between evolutionary rate and population size. I examined this prediction by using mammalian gene sequences of protein coding genes available at that time. Uh, these three lineages and uh, synonymous and non-synonymous tree. You find that generation time effect is more conspicuous in synonymous tree as compared with non-synonymous tree because rodent has longer branch is synonymous as compared with uh, no, uh, primates. And this difference in pattern uh, is compatible with the nearly neutral prediction. In genomic age, there are lots more data to examine. There are many, uh, several reports uh, I just pick up uh, four. All these patterns are in accord with the nearly neutral prediction. Uh, generation time effect comes into the picture. Polymorphisms also are in accord with the nearly neutral prediction. There are now numerous data on SNPs um, protein coding regions and other regions. And if you examine protein coding regions uh, as compared with synonymous SNPs, non-synonymous SNPs contain more rare frequency alleles that are slightly deleterious. And Tajma D is an indicator. Uh, non-synonymous D is more negative and synonymous D is rather positive, so this is in accord with the nearly neutral prediction. Analysis of genome data of protein coding uh, regions of uh, uh, East uh, provide a nice uh, support of the near neutrality. Uh, in East, there are several subspecies isolated, no migration with various population sizes, deaths. And these subspecies have different population sizes. And these uh, people examined uh, pattern of polymorphism and divergence among these subspecies. They found negative correlation between heterodiversity and ratio of synonymous or uh, non-synonymous to synonymous diversity among populations. This is explained by the nearly neutral theory. Also, comparison fixed versus polymorphic SNPs, PNPS is polymorphic non-synonymous to synonymous ratio. And DNDS is divergent non-synonymous 
no jūs reišo. Man piena pies izrādja visi izrēja. Visi jūs mēnī, rēja, no šīnā jūs smukt, un tad tā rai, kurī tu bija. Es rais arī dēļ tie arī sam, nais saport, un tā nē arī nūtara prediksā. Now we consider the problem of gene regulation. It is often argued that morphological evolution uh, is governed mainly by gene regulation rather than by genes themselves. And uh, uh, gene regulation uh, is a uh, has been a very interesting problem for me for a long time, but developmental biology is mainly based on morphological observation, and uh, material bases are only becoming clear nowadays. So it is another exciting time for evolution people, I believe. And the uh, fundamental question on regulatory system is uh, how complex regulatory systems could have evolved. I, I think, uh, not like uh, Professor Alba talk, I am more concerned with higher organism uh, evolution. Uh, particularly interesting is higher organisms with the large genome size. If you look at the system biology paper, uh, we, we are struck by very complicated network systems and uh, how such complex system, network system, could have evolved, it was a puzzling problem for me for many years. How selection drift worked, how epigenetic effects influence. Uh, epigenetics also is an uh, important area, and we have known for a long time that the environmental effect is important, but material basis based on molecular, uh, molecular other uh, uh, investigation is becoming only clarif clarified in recent years. Uh, Drift and selection is all. Uh, drift and selection are also working together. Uh, seems to be supported by some observation. Let me introduce a couple of them. Uh, these people examined the ratio of gene expression divergence between species to gene expression diversity within species. This ratio was uh, mostly same in various tissues and organs, except testes. And they argued that in various uh, tissues and organs, neutral and nearly neutral evolution is the main process. But in testes, positive Darwinian selection must be important, they said. More uh, quantitative detailed analysis has been performed by Bedford Hartle, uh, they examined the divergence pattern of gene expression among several Drosophila species. Uh, divergence initially goes up initially with time separ after separation, but eventually reaches plateau. And this is because stabilizing selection on gene expression is working here. And uh, they used the quantitative genetics model and uh, estimated uh, st uh, strengths of uh, stabilizing selection in these data, uh, to, to explain these data and found that the strength of stabilizing selection is estimated to be very weak, mostly fit in the range of near neutrality. So under stabilizing selection, system seems to be shifting and drifting. Also, ENCODE probe 
ENCODE project provide data uh, that the uh, human genome, certain region of human genome, are uh, very active, uh, producing X, excess transcript in human cell line. And they argue that such excess activity should be the result of nearly uh, neutral or nearly neutral evolution. But to me, such extra activity would provide excellent opportunities for shifting uh, complex network systems. Uh, okay. um, such extra activity might be a basis for shifting and uh, modification of network systems. This is a figure I have shown in the previous uh, talk. Uh, in thinking these problems, uh, what's going on between genotype and phenotype is most important. Uh, robust genetic system, robust regulatory system, uh, co-option in gene regulation might be easier because many uh, mutants become a very weak effect and uh, may become neutral or nearly neutral. Epigenetics uh, is tremendously expanding nowadays of, uh, in which chromatin structure is uh, very interesting to evolution people. Uh, DNA maturation and other, other, uh, other stochastic variation of gene expression, and this stochastic variation in gene expression, environmental factors might have some effect. There are several reports that suggest such, a, uh, such factors. And I, I thought at the genotype, uh, mainly nearly neutral process going on, we are uh, phenotype, more positive Darwinian selection may be uh, observed. And in thinking uh, epigenetics, recent progress is remarkable. I cannot. Uh, understand everything. Uh, also, I cannot present um, many important papers. I just pick up some of them. Uh, chromatin structure is uh, very important. Nucleosome positioning and density. Uh, it is said now that nucleosome depleted regions are more accessible and often contain enhancers, uh, active enhancers, and so on. Uh, accessibility depends on some parts to DNA sequence, uh, uh, chromatin uh, remodeling and modeling complex, nucleosome modification and histone variants and modifications. So many complex systems are uh, related. Also an uh, interesting paper I found was an insider cell, uh, messenger RNA uh, competing each other by a micro RNA response element. Uh, micro RNA have several targets, and inside the cell, there are competition among messenger RNA. And uh, uh, might have some effect to the uh, end product of transcription. As an example, uh, they point out that messenger RNA of pseudogene might have some effect in this competition process. So uh, in, in some cases, it, 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 does, it does not go to rapid deterioration. And also, there are many papers that report about epigenetics and human disease. Uh, we have known for a long time that uh, 
エンバイロンメンタルコンディションっていうアーリーディベロップメントハブインポータントエフェクトインレイターライフアダルトオンセットディシーズニューロディジェネラティブディソーダンソーウィアゼオゼアワンゼアハズビンノンバッタマテリアルベーシスイズビカミングリビールドナウアデイスエピジェネティクスリレイトトゥコンプレックスディシーズアストマティモアビヘビアアイキューコンプレックエピジェネティクスマイトビアサムアブノーマルクロマチンストラクチャーマイトリザルトインディスカインドオバーコンプレックスディシーズイン・シンキング・オール・ディーズ・エピジェネティック・エフェクト・オン・フィノタイプ・インタープレイ・オブ・セレクション・アンド・エピジェネティックス・エピジェノーミックス・マイト・ビー・ベリー・インポータント・アンド・ディス・アー・メビー・ファウンド・バイ・エボリューション・バイ・ドキング・アット・エボリューション・トランスポーザブル・エレメント・ファンディーズ・トランスポーザブルエレベントハズビンハザロングヒストリーフォーエヴァリションピープルバッタオンリーフェノメノロジカリーインベスティゲイテッドアンダーフォーエキザンプルヒッケイショーザットアウトブリーディングイズネセサリーフォーエクスパンションアンダーディーズピープルサブディバイデッドポピュレーションストラクチャーイズインポータント And if you think about life cycle of TE,、uh, invasion、uh, started,、uh, there may be early loss, and transposition, selection, and deletion, equilibrium, and then domestication occurs, and、uh, maybe loss later. And、uh, at this later period, Activity itself was、uh, low, uh, lost, has been.、Okay. So、TEs lose、uh, activity function for transposition and expression.、Uh, and、uh, some people argue that drift m a k e instability of this life cycle. So, drift selection and uh, uh, epigenetics is.、Uh, Very well, well, they are working together. Uh, in looking at transposable element evolution and function,、uh, gene silencing is most important rather than co option or recruitment. Gene silencing is very, very important here. And according to Slotkin and、uh, Tensei,、uh, there are two mechanisms involved in gene silencing of transposable element. One is small interference RNA involving uh, mechanism. Uh, this, by this, after transcription,、uh, transcript are cleaved and degenerated. So,、uh, no, no function. Another mechanism is to make heterochromatin of, of、uh, regions with TE. And、uh, again, RNAi involved very complex systems here.、Uh, this complex system、uh, recruitment of、uh, heterochromatin. Fact, making heterochromatin factors and、uh, TE regions become heterochromatin. Then、uh, the expression is silenced. However, once in a while, transposable elements become very functional. And use seems to be useful. There are so many papers, I just picked up one. Retro transposon expansion and CTCF binding. 
According to these people, the CTCF binding is a little more conservative than ordinary transcription factor binding sites. So a little um, seems to be a little important. And the uh, retro element repeat driven expansion of CTCF binding sites uh, seems to be very common in genomes of rat, dog, mouse, or person they examined. But not in human, they say. But uh, in, in general, it seems that uh, uh, transposable element might be contributing some important functions. Although, at initial phase, they must be uh, silenced. Well, um, silen gene silencing is, in fact, a, a defensing mechanism of a host genome to protect themselves. Uh, so uh, this is uh, another amazing complex system. And in thinking all these uh, facts and uh, theories and observations, I must say that uh, selection and epigenomics work together, and also selection and drift, drift and epigenomics, all work together to provide such complex systems for uh, higher organisms, gene regulatory, gene regulatory network. Uh, thank you for your attention. I think there's time for one or two questions, if there or comments, if there are any. Well, in that case, I have a question. Oh, did I see a hand? If you have alternating very strong selection, either positive or negative, but it alternates randomly in time, would that look like nearly neutral evolution? Uh, might be, if you if you observe uh, a long time scale, but if you, you have a very fine scale experiment and so on, mm -hmm. under various conditional uh, changes, you might find such a case. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go on to the next speaker, Dr. Saito who is going to talk about neutrality as an egalitarian view of genome evolution. Thank you for introduction. Uh, my name is Saito. I'm also from Mishima National Institute of Genetics. Uh, when I was a high school student, I started to read some general books for, on evolution. Then I thought it's strange. All books uh, show the importance of adaptations or positive selections, Darwinian selection. I thought it's strange. I thought using some of my uh, simple High school, high school level biology knowledge, I thought obviously mutation is the driving force of evolution. And I don't change. So maybe it's a good example of pre-adaptation or according to uh, Dr. Kimura's uh, proposed nomenclature, uh, Dijkhuizen heart effect. So I was neutralist before I uh, came to know the uh, neutral theory. Uh, so anyway, today I'd like to show three topics uh, under this kind of world view. First one is isocore, or GC content heterogeneity in vertebrates. Uh, it was already published two years ago in GBE, 
Uh, but anyway, I thought it a good opportunity uh, to show this to you with some new stuff. The second one is human-specific changes, uh, mainly done by Sumiyama. It was published last year in MBE. The third one is about uh, lineage-specific conservations in mammals, just published in GBE. So first one is about the uh, isocore. Uh, Ota, uh, he does have no relationship with Dr. Tomoko Ota. Anyway, uh, he was my former student, and uh, uh, he, he did a very interesting work with mathematician, Dr. Kawamura, and myself. So uh, this is a kind of review of the GC content heterogeneity among vertebrates. We used these data histograms from Dr. Bernardi's group's paper, Costantini et al., 2006. And uh, we put the phylogeny. So if you look at these three uh, red uh, colored box, you will see high GC content ranges uh, in three different lineages. The top one is puffer fish. The second one is uh, chicken, of course, no, well known. And the third one is uh, placental mammals. So uh, we know that uh, uh, birds and uh, placental mammals share the same patterns. But uh, now we know platypus, opossum, although they are also mammals, they have different patterns. And also, in fish, there are some differences. Therefore, from the phylogenetic point of view, as shown by three black ovals, there are three evolutionary part, uh, periods where high GC content emerged. Uh, so once at the origin of ammonite in the question mark, maybe I thought uh, this kind of high GC content emerged, but it seems it's more complex. It's still uh, GC content heterogeneity uh, system in vertebrates is still enigmatic for us. For the long time, uh, to explain the GC content change, usually people used constant mutation model. From GC to AT, rate U, from AT to GC, reverse, rate V, uh, using a standard uh, population genetics model. Now we propose a variable mutation model. Although biological mechanism is not yet uh, clear, we hypothesize that the rate of these two types, U and V, may be correlated or proportional to the temporal proportion of GC content, GCT then uh, mutation rate may vary from time to time uh, when GC content changes. Under this variable model, uh, we may have this kind of situations. Here, the horizontal is the GC content of the time t, and the vertical one is GC content of time t plus 1 in terms of some unit. In this case, if uh, equilibrium was main, uh, obtained, we have this uh, x, y equal x, 45 degree line. This is equilibrium. But in reality, maybe the relationship is not this way, like that. Then uh, we need some time, actually very long time, to reach the equilibrium which is the intersection between the, this concave uh, line and dotted equilibrium line. Uh, to show that, we used uh, half map human SNP data. And to, to have the directionality of mutation, we used orthologous chimpanzee genome data. And the uh, unit time is said to be the coalescence time of two uh, alleles, two genes, it means two times 
N e. If the uh, human population size, effective size is about 10,000, and if the uh, average uh, age, I mean, generation time is 25 years, it is approximately uh, half a million years. So, uh, now there's a difference. Uh, if we use the usual constant model, starting from different GC content uh, ranges, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to 0 0.8, there are quite varieties. If we time goes on, eventually we go to about uh, 34 to 37 percent range. So there are kind of ice core vanishment observed, roughly speaking, for the constant model. But if we use variable model in the right, now we have a very nice uh, real equilibrium, single point equilibrium, about uh, 36 percent, 36 to 37 percent uh, from different current heterogeneous ones. So we agree, uh, maybe in the long run, uh, ice core will vanish. However, it's a, it's a very slow process. If you look at the unit time, we need more than 1,000 unit time. It means uh, uh, 500 million years, very long time. So uh, it's not so easy to vanish isocore. Then we have two more classes, theoretically, under the vari variable model. So one is this uh, one peak here, concave, and uh, here is more complex, class three. In this case, some chaotic process may emerge, like this. In this case, eventually it goes to the equilibrium, but uh, in some strange pattern case, in this case, uh, I do not go into detail, but anyway, under some circumstances, this chaotic behavior may happen. So we, we will not reach that uh, equilibrium point as an intersection of these uh, two lines. So uh, this is still unpublished result uh, by Ota, uh, but uh, if we start from different GC content ranges, although eventually uh, it looks like to go to the equilibrium, but uh, sometimes very strange oscillation, chaotic oscillation may happen based on human chromosome one data or chromosome two data. And even if we start from the similar equilibrium frequency, we expect about 36%, which is lower, much lower than the current human genome, GC content, 41%. We may find strength, very uh, immediate change of the GC content increase or decrease just by chance, by kind of oscillations or chaotic ones, then we may have very uh, heterogeneous patterns. So this is, of course, computer simulations, but uh, we'd like to conclude that cosmos, uh, as we see now, and the chaos are interchangeable. So if we accept this model, GC content evolution may be just pure neutral process without having no uh, positive selection or ne negative selection. This is the first topic. The second one was mainly done by Dr. Sumiawa of my lab. And it, uh, it appeared in MBE last year. Uh, in 2008, Prabhka et al published a paper in Science to show that uh, one region called HAC NS1, uh, which they found many substitutions, substitutions uh, in red runs, uh, within only 81 base pair, changed expression pattern, shown here, in human DNA and the chimpanzee and the rhesus monkey ocelots, there are clear differences. Only in uh, human DNA transgenic mice, there are some expressions in shoulder, uh, junction of forearm and hand plate. But in chimpanzee or rhesus 
uh, DNA transgenic mice, there are no such expression, so it's human specific. It's a beautiful discovery. However, uh, they claimed that this change was uh, driven by positive Darwinian selection. So they did this experiment and they showed that uh, by knocking experiment, there is a, these 13 substitutions regions uh, of these 81 bases are critical. Uh, we agree. However, for our surprise, they didn't do any knockout experiment, but we did. So this is what we did. Uh, A1, part A, is uh, just a confirmation of their result. We used uh, hot NS1 human sequence and the transgenic mice were obtained. So we also observed the same pattern. There's a confirmation. But now we changed that 81 human specific sequence to simple GAATTC kind of knockout. But this knockout uh, DNA driven transgenic mice showed very similar pattern. No change. Strange, no? So our interpretation is this. Maybe common ancestor of human, chimpanzee, and macaque had these ancestral ones without uh, changes. But this 81 base pair is maybe repressor of some uh, particular gene expression. So by mutations, many mutations simultaneously, maybe not substitutions, independent substitutions, which they anticipated, but of course, uh, not of course, maybe some of you may know that later uh, they are criticized by uh, French people that uh, maybe they are biased, GC, GC biased gene conversions. We, uh, we agree with that view. So maybe because of that, uh, in the human lineages, it's a kind of knockout. So actually, this is not a gain function, but a loss of function. And this change may be neutral not positive selection. So, conclusion is, uh, more haste, less speed. We should do more care careful studies. So, because default is neutrality, we should first think neutral explanation. We should not jump into, uh, conclude to some positive selection if we find some change in the human lineage. I think still we are human-centric. We should, we should forget this human-centric view. The third topic uh, just published uh, is a part of uh, uh, my former student, uh, Takahashi Mahoko's PhD thesis, appeared in uh, GBE. So we studied uh, primate-specific and rodent-specific highly conserved non-coding regions. For primates, we compared human genome and marmoset genome first. Then later, we checked chimpanzee, orangutan, and macaque uh, genomes. And also for the mouse uh, rodents, we use mouse and rat genomes. Uh, recently, uh, guinea pig and some other rodent species genomes are available, but that when we started this study, uh, only mouse and rat genome data are most reliable and available ones, so we did it. And of course, to eliminate shared conservations, we used other mammalians or vertebrate, other non-mammalian non vertebrate species genomes. Uh, this is a uh, strategy to extract linear-specific HTNSs, many steps. Then, uh, after observing, finding many such highly conserved sequences, we checked their flanking region. They look like kind of well. So we found very deep well. It means very small number of substitutions for these sh very short, uh, maybe only 100 or 200 bases. But flanking regions have very high substitutions, almost same as uh, genomic averages, except for some very uh, near 
planking regions. So maybe the real biological unit may be longer than 200 or 300 bases, a bit longer. But anyway, uh, they are very narrowed. Because some people criticized our result, maybe they are uh, mutational cold spot. But we showed that these are not. Another way to check this is to check the human SNP patterns. We checked derived area frequency DAF distributions in three populations, Yoruba, Asian, and uh, Caucasian. And uh, we, show, we found that uh, these regions we found are following the expected pattern. It means uh, we, they are under constraint, selectively constrained. And also, uh, if we checked the location of these highly conserved non-coding regions we found in primates and rodents, compared to genomic regions in the left, uh, there are more intronic regions. And although it looks very small, but untranslated regions also very high. Then we checked, uh, we searched these linear specific non-coding region flanking, also uh, flanking genes, protein genes in primates and rodents. Uh, these are examples of linear specific highly conserved uh, non-coding flanking genes we call LHF genes. So for example, uh, panel A is PBX1, and uh, this, one, this blue one is primate-specific non-coding ones. And interestingly, ultra core elements, two of them are not far from this PBX1, and also PBX3, SOX13, SOX6, and uh, MS, MEF2C, NPAS3, NPS32, and FOXP1. So often, uh, ultra conserved elements can be found in some area. So this is Venn ben diagram. Uh, this is a rodent specific and a primate specific and UCE. And uh, all three may be shared for 11 genes in A. And if you look at these uh, genes by gene ontology database, GO, then we found high frequency of transcriptional regulation or protein binding gene uh, with a high statistical significance. So we think the, these high specific conserved regions specific to primates, rodents, are important for each lineages. So conclusion is creation of highly conserved non-coding sequences, HCNSs, shapes up the diversity. And combination of these HCNSs defines each lineage specificity. Uh, uh, before finishing my talk, I'd like to mention that uh, when we started this paper in introduction, uh, this is about the regulation of, of protein coding regions. So many people cite King and Wilson's paper, 78. But uh, we also mentioned that 10 years before, 1965, Tsukaka and Poling already mentioned the almost the same thing. So we started uh, cite citing Tsukaka and Poling 65 paper. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments or discussion? Well, I yes. Uh, um, recombination rate, I think there is no such hotspot. Uh, Dure's group uh, mentioned that uh, they may be caused by uh, GC bias gene conversions. So I think this is a major problem, a major change, yeah, major source, not recombination, I think. Bill, you had a question? Uh, educate me. I I'm having trouble following these highly conserved non-coding sequences. So my question is, is twofold. About how many of them are there? 
in an average genome and are they expressed this looks like very strong purifying selection so about how many and are they expressed we checked transcript arms and over up is very small so most of them seems to be not expressed but of course transcript on study is not complete we don't know whether they expressed in a very short time in some particular developmental stage we don't know and there are many we just used top 1,000 but there are so many and some of them can be more than 700 bases so it's amazing Any other questions or comments? I totally agree with your assessment. Um, the initial authors um, on the transgenic mice should have been warned because in the lower panel with the macaque sequence, uh, you see already a pattern that looks like the human, so that depends very much on the interrogation point. Mm -hmm. So I also agree with you, nowadays people just want to prove their points rather than disproving, so Popper would rotate in his grave. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any others? Uh, let me uh, say thank all of the speakers for uh, the remarkable feat of staying on time without prompting. They have set an example for every speaker at every meeting and have given you extra time for coffee. So if we could now break and reconvene at 11 o'clock, we will have the next set, uh, part of this session. Thank you very much.